to go to Romans chapter 2 again. Might be a little unorthodox. We're going to skip some verses and come back to them next week. Jared still did the wild side. I will explain why. But <laughs> Romans 2. We're going to look at verses 12 and 16 today. But because verses 13 through 15 are this parenthetical statement that Paul inserts in here to expound further upon the doers of the law and the law that's written on hearts by nature. And we'll look at that a little bit next week. But we'll go ahead and read verses 12 through 16 to get the whole context here. He says, after he says there is no respect of persons with God, we looked at last week in verse 11, he says, For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Amen. I promise we're almost at the end of judgment being the main topic here, but Paul spent quite a bit of time talking about judgment. This is an important topic to think on. Mm -hmm. Today we live in a day where no one wants to be judged, and they'll say, "Well, only God can judge me," and that should be a very sobering thought to think that God will, will judge us one day. Mm -hmm. But here He gives only two groups of people. Verse number twelve, He says, "For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law." There's those without the law and those under the law. If you will. Mm -hmm. well, for as many as have sinned without the law, that's both those who lived before the time of the law was given and also those Gentiles who were not under the Mosaic law. But yet they still sinned before God. Mm -hmm. We'll get into more of that later on in the book of Romans about sin being imputed and death reigning, but yet sin has always been sin before God, even before Moses laid down that law, all the way back to the garden, man was in a sinful state. All right. But it wasn't just that the law was, <clears throat> and all of a sudden we started sinning. No, man was always sinful. Amen. It says, as many as sinned without the law, they should also perish without the law. They should, mm -hmm. and even though they didn't have the law, they will still perish, he says. That's, they will be fully destroyed in hell one day. Right. Now, I don't, I don't believe they'll be consumed necessarily, but they'll, it's an eternal destruction. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. and Christ in Luke chapter 13 said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Right. Whether you're under the law or in, or not under the law, you will perish because of your sin. He says, "Except you repent, you shall likewise perish." He repeats it in two verses. Well, of course, we have the promise if we are His in John chapter ten that we shall never perish. Mm -hmm. John ten verse twenty-eight. Turn there real quick, and I'll read it for us. <coughs> I think Brother Larry was preaching from the earlier part of this chapter recently. The whole chapter is full of assurance for Christ. But verse 27 is one of my favorite verses, and he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Amen. Verse 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Verse 29 goes on to say, My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Amen. If we are in Christ, if we have this eternal life that He gives, He says we shall never perish. Well, these 
really the key to verse 12 of our text is, are we in Christ or are we not in Christ? Right. As we see in our next part of the verse here, it says, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Well, even though there, there was a group of people, the Jews primarily, and a few Gentiles that were underneath the law, and yet they knew the law, and yet they knew the condemnation that came about because of sin. Yet he says, they shall be judged, they still sinned, even in that law. Mm -hmm. The law itself cannot keep us from sinning. In fact, uh, Romans 3.20 tells us, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right. Well, yeah. All the law did was point out our sinfulness, yeah. showed us that we could not keep God's standard of perfection. Right. Galatians 3, 21 tells us that there is not a law that could give us life, else righteousness would come by the law. We can't, let us not be mistaken and think that keeping the law is what saved the Old Testament saints. All right. Even Abraham said it was, he had faith and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Yeah. You know, we couldn't ignore the law either, just as we cannot ignore serving God today. But right. Just because they had the law didn't make them without sin. Yeah. See, so Christ is the only one that was able to fulfill that perfect law. Amen. And yet, we know that. God gave permission for sacrifices to cover the sins of the people because he knew they would not be able to keep the law. He knew that they would would eventually break the law and need some sort of covering. Mm -hmm. Of course, as we studied a couple years ago, we, we know all those sacrifices pointed to Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. But we turn over chapter 10 of Hebrews for just a moment. Chapter 10, verse 4, and then verse 11 as well. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Then he goes on to talk about the coming of Christ. In verse 11 he says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Amen. Those sacrifices can only cover sins for a time, but they can never fully take them away. Amen. Notice well, verse number 10, where we were just at there, it says, By the which, that is Christ, we were all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12 says, But this man, speaking of Christ again, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Amen. See, Christ made one one sacrifice for sin to sanctify us through his blood, he says. But that, those Old Testament sacrifices could never do that. Right. Yet, despite the fact that they had these <laughs> sacrifices, despite the fact that they <coughs> knew full well the condemnation came about because of transgressing the law, yet they still sinned, he says. Right. And he says they shall be judged by the law. So this is a problem with the the modern day Judaizers that we have. The, well, they call themselves different things. The, those that say we need to keep go back under the law. And that group in Massonville went as far as to say that the, old, the New Testament's a complete lie and Christ is not who he said he was. Mm. So they'll be judged by the law one day. Found, right. They'll find out their right. righteousness is not sufficient. That only the blood of Christ can take away sin. And that's the problem. The problem with works-based type salvation is that you'll be judged by your works one day and you'll be found lacking. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's really what Paul is saying here. Those that Sin in the law, they're going to be judged by that law. But there's not been a man yet, aside of Christ, that was able to ever satisfy all the demands of the law. 
that ultimately what will matter when we stand before God is if we are in Christ or out of Christ. Right. How well we kept the law or even just the commands of God will not may be important to us as a child of God, but yet that will not determine whether we are saved or not saved. Right. So we'll come back to verses 13 through 15 next week. Let's look down verse 16. It's hinging on the same verse 12 here. It says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. In the day when God shall judge. Judgment day is coming. You can be sure of that. Amen. So whether you believe there's one judgment or two judgments or 15 judgments, we're all going to stand before God on one day. That's right. That's it. Well, I don't know if it's all going to be on the same literal 24-hour day or not, but I do know we all going to stand before God and give an account. Amen. I do know that God has appointed a day wherein he shall judge the world, Acts 17 tells us. Hey, whatever. Even if we're saved, we're going to have to give an account for the deeds done in this body, whether they be good or evil. Certainly the, the lost will stand there and be judged by their works. And they'll open that land's book of life and see that their name is not written down and cast in the right. fire. And yes, there is coming the day when God shall judge. And all those who want to be judged by the works, I think they'll be unpleasantly surprised when they find that their works were, weren't good enough. You got it. Amen. But he says, he shall judge the secrets of men. And there's not going to be any secrets left on Judgment Day. There you go. Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says that he shall bring every work to judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. So all the good you've done in secret, that's going to come out. All the evil you've done too, that's going to come out as well. And we, we do a lot of things in secret, I know. We try to hide things from our, whether it's our, from our pastor in church or from fellow man, things that we don't, not necessarily quote proud of. But yet, God's going to bring all that out to judgment day and we'll all have to give an answer for this. Amen. Hebrews 4 13 tells us that all things are naked and open before God. So he sees all. So we might hide it before men, but we won't be able to hide it inside of God. Uh, kind of like when Adam sinned in the garden. He thought he would go hide, him and Eve. When God said, where, where art thou, Adam? He wasn't asking Adam where it was because God didn't know him. He wanted Adam to see that he knew he was hiding from him. You're right. So we can try to hide before God, but we ultimately can't hide anything in his sight. Let's turn over to Psalms for a moment. Psalms 44. I've always known this, but I guess I never really thought about it until I was studying for this lesson. And we talked about, about all the things we do in secret and the things that we hide before men. God will see those things. But notice the words of the psalm is in verse 21, Psalms 44. It says, Shall God God search us out, for he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Amen. That God knows even the secrets that are in our heart, things that we don't reveal before others, the things that we keep hidden within ourselves. Yet God knows even that. Even the, those wicked thoughts that we may have that right. we never never proceed out of us. Yet God knows about those as well. That should be a for lack of a better word, it's a scary thought. And mm -hmm. God knows those. You're right. Amen. Like I said, uh, I think of Moses when he would kill the Egyptian man. He thought he he thought he did it in secret, and he thought he covered it up. Of course, God saw him, but he even did his fellow brother and sister saw him. They, they called him out the next day or so. I forget how long it was. And, and he ran and hid. 
But yet, God knows even when you think. You know, a bad thought towards your brother or sister. You say, I hate that person. Or say, I don't like this or that. Or I don't want to do this for God today. Or maybe it's a, a lustful or evil thought. Yeah, God knows even those thoughts. And that should be a, at least a very sobering thought for us. Right. And he'll bring even those things out and you will know about them. Let's turn over to John chapter Excuse me. We'll we'll turn to John chapter 5. Back in our text, he says that he will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. That Christ is going to be the judge. Right. John chapter 5. Christ expounds upon that thought of him judging here. Beginning in verse number 22. We thank you. I think sometimes we think of Christ and his compassion and his love, and those are good things and things we ought to emulate. It says that he will judge the world one day. In fact, over there in the Acts 17 31, where I quoted earlier that God appointed a day of judgment, he says it will be by that man he is appointed, which is Christ. Right. John chapter 5, verse 22, he says. <laughs> For the Father judgeth no man, but he hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Amen. See, God the Father is the, the ultimate judge, but he says he's given that judgment to Christ. In verse 23 he goes on to say that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Me and Adam were discussing a little bit the other day about the Godhead. It's hard to describe that dynamic in man's terms. Right. How all that works between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and how they present themselves and the characteristics they have. How they're yet three unique persons and yet all in one. Right. Yet he says that the Father is given the Son, the power for or the authority of judgment, and he says that all men are to honor the Son now as the honor of the Father. If you don't honor the one, you don't honor the other. Right. And he goes on to say in verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that hath sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. So here we have the promise of salvation in Christ. And you notice verse 25, and he said that they that hear shall live. Mm-hmm. We all are spiritually dead, but not all are going to hear. The call goes out across the whole world, but yet only him that hath ear will hear. He said, The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Amen. So in Christ is this eternal life, and Christ is this spiritual life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Verse 26 says, For as the Father hath life in him, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. That the Father is the originator of all life, and yet he says he's given this this power, if you will, to give life unto Christ. We know in him is our life, in him is really our all our source of spiritual life. Verse 27 he says, And have given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and one day Christ is coming back as a that ruling righteous king. Amen. That's Logan said he's coming with a flaming fire, taking vengeance on all them that know not God and believe or and obey not the gospel. He's coming back one day to execute judgment upon this world. Amen. Verse 28 says, Marvel not this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Verse 29 and shall come forth. And they that have done they have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done 
evil and the, res re <coughs> the resurrection of damnation. This way to be think that there's two Amen. distinct judgments. Maybe they happen on the same day, I don't know, but there's the saved that will be resurrected to life and the, the unsaved that will be resurrected to eternal condemnation. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn there, read a couple verses for us here. Verses 24 through 26. And this whole chapter is about the resurrection, beginning with Christ's resurrection, how it's our hope, and ending with our resurrection, being made incorruptible and immortal in Christ, and how He gives us the victory over death in the grave. Amen. Here in verse, right in the middle of verse 22, or excuse me, verse 24. He says, Then cometh the end. Talk about after Christ coming, verse 23. He says, Christ first, we have to lay there, Christ as coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Amen. So Christ has this reign, this authority, this rule from God. It says one day he's going to lay it down again to the Father. <coughs> not till the end. Not until the last enemy is defeated. And if I understand the scriptures right, death is defeated when it's cast in the lake of fire. Amen. There at the great white throne of judgment. So after he judges all the, the wicked and judges us as well, he says he'll turn his rule and reign back over to the Father. But until that time, you can be sure Christ is, has the authority to rule. He has the authority to execute judgment, and he will, at his coming, execute that judgment. Certainly for us, it will be a glorious time for his coming. For the unsaved, it will be a time of much weeping and wailing, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Amen. For us, it might be a time of weeping and wailing, too, when we have to give account for all our sins and failures. But, you know, we can still claim the blood of Christ and that we don't have any condemnation in us. Amen. Yet those who aren't saved, they will stand condemned. They'll stand without any advocate, without any one to plead their cause, without any thing to cling to with their own filthy righteousness. Yet they'll be judged by their works, by the law, by the perfect right standard which God has set forth. Amen. Amen. You know, without the blood of Christ applied, well, all that will be insufficient. Mm -hmm. Oh. Go back to our text and close. He says that you'll judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Well, that doesn't mean that Paul is saying it's the gospel about him. It's, it's the gospel he possessed, the gospel he believed and preached. Amen. Just as a, a side note, many people believe, and you're probably likely that Paul had. Luke's gospel to read because Luke was his traveling companion. Yet no matter which it is, it's, he says it's in accordance or it's agreeable to the gospel. That, Amen. That Christ will judge the secrets of men one day. That we will stand before God and give an account before him. Mm -hmm. Certainly the, the crux, if you will, the the tip of the iceberg of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But it mm -hmm. certainly extends much more than that. Right. All of his perfect life, all the scriptures point to him coming and his perfect sacrifice. So he is the ruling righteous king and he will come again in judgment. All of that in agreement with the gospel. Yeah. And you know, we are to preach the whole gospel to the whole world, aren't we? That's it. We should preach salvation in Christ. We doesn't mean we can't warn others that judgment is coming. 
All of that is in accordance or in agreement with the gospel. Amen. Then, Lord, when we'll look at this issue of the heart next week about not just being hearers of the law, but being doers of the law, and how the, the Gentiles, even though they didn't have the law, were he says a law unto themselves. The man will be without excuse when he stands before God. That's it. We'll close with that. Amen. Amen.